Good evening, everyone. So great to see you all here. How do we feel about Sphinx Connect 2019 so far? Yeah? Good, good. So, so great to hear that. And so great to have you all here for the inaugural Sphinx Tank. So a little about me first. My name is Garrett McQueen. I work in public radio, but I started my career as a professional bassoonist. I spent two seasons with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra here as the African American Fellow. Um, from there, I um, spent five seasons with the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra as second bassoon. And toward the end of my time uh, in Knoxville, this was in 2016, I started transitioning into public radio. So WUOT-FM took me on, and the, the attention and the stories I told about our music, classical music, by uh, people of color was really exciting to a lot of people. There were stories that they had never heard before, and, and, uh, and that excitement eventually led me to uh, my current position as national host and producer of classical at American Public Media in St. Paul, Minnesota. Now, I, thank you. Now, I, I share my story as an example of just one of the many outstanding organizations represented here within the Sphinx family. You know, we, we play in the finest orchestras all around the world. We, we lead arts administration in, in very important organizations. I even understand there are other radio people here, but, you know, we're so much more than that. You know, here at Sphinx, we aren't just people who place ourselves in some of the leading well-established organizations. We, we create organizations of our own. We're, we're freelancers, we're entrepreneurs, and tonight you get to see what happens at the beginning for one really lucky entrepreneur here. This is Sphinx Tank 2019, and tonight one team or individual will win a $10,000 grant to, to get their project off and running to a really great start. You'll also get the opportunity to, to put your input in, the, the uh, audience participation, uh, the, the audience winner, the audience uh, choice winner will get uh, $2,000 to start off their program. So this is such an important and such an exciting panel. So I hope you'll pay attention, uh, prepare your questions for the uh, candidates, and get ready for a, a really exciting time. Um, I'm here to introduce um, someone who really just embodies the idea of what it means to be an entrepreneur. None of us would be here convening, networking, learning more about each other, and advancing our own careers without him. So I would love to introduce, it's my honor to introduce teacher, administrator, writer, poet, and the founder of the Sphinx organization, Mr. Aaron Dworkin. Thank you so much, Garrett, and thank you all for coming and welcome to Sphinx Tank. So this is an inaugural initiative for Sphinx, so we'll see how it goes. Um, less than half of 1% of orchestra presidents are black. Less than 1% are Latinx. And the numbers are very similar in when you, we look at newly founded arts organizations, so those entrepreneurs in the field. Sphinx is committed to, develop, to developing not only the next generation of performers that we see on stage, but also the future administrative and entrepreneurial leadership of our field. And that commitment includes the Sphinx LEAD program, which is nurturing all types of administrative leaders, but also this, the Sphinx Tank which is designed to not only support and, and provide that initial preparation for its direct participants, but also share with all of you those best practices, the things that are absolutely needed if you are going to be successful, if you are trying to develop a creative, sustainable enterprise. So as a result of this focus, where we really want to unearth the reality of these programs, we may ask probing questions and or criticize the participants who come before us today. But understand that this is within the context of preparing them for this trajectory that they are on. They are all phenomenal. They would not be already have been selected to be part of this program if not. So you have to make sure you keep those potential 
criticism or things that we try to unearth in what they're doing in light of uh, that context. And regardless of who wins today, all of them will receive $1,000 in support of their program. And again, as Garrett mentioned, they will have an audience choice award. So all of you can look uh, at to uh, be able to engage your phones later on and select. And the audience choice will receive $2,000. And of course, the winner will receive a $10,000 grant. In addition to that, this is not just about this evening. So this is designed to have an entire arc to this program and an arc to support all four candidates' projects. So as part of that, Sphinx has invited several key leaders to become network partners with Sphinx Tank. And they have agreed to be able to provide feedback throughout the year and meet with each and every one of the candidates so that they are able to have that guidance. Um, and they reflect extraordinary organizations, leadership, and especially funding resources that they either have led and they know this field inside and out. Um, and a few of them are here with us this evening, and I just wanted to point out we have uh, John Bracey, uh, who is here, if he could stand, and is the former executive director of the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. <laughs> One of my very first meetings uh, in the early days of Sphinx. Uh, and uh, as an entity is you know, distributing over $11 million annually. Um, we also have uh, Ken Fisher, who is unable to be here with us this evening, but is a Sphinx board member, former president of the University Musical Society, um, and certainly someone from whom I have learned more about fundraising, relationship building, networking, and will be a tremendous resource for all of our candidates. We also have Sharnita Johnson, who's here with us, who's the program director. Yes of the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation. She's one of the most respected funders in our field. And again, they're um, uh, you know, granting out millions of dollars uh, every year. Uh, and also, we have Christine Leahy, who is here with us from the New York State <laughs> Council for the Arts, and is, who is their director of arts programs. Uh, and they're granting over $45 million annually. Um, and there's also an additional network member who I'll mention in a moment. So you get a sense of this literal network that our candidates will be able to benefit from throughout the year. Uh, keep in mind, you'll be able to pose some of your own questions through Slido, so be able to submit those through slido.com, hashtag Sphinx Connect. Um, and so, we have four outstanding candidates. One is a team of two, and they will come into the Sphinx Tank today and present their projects. Each candidate will have eight minutes to present their project to our panel. We have already received their written proposals and materials. So today, we will hear their presentations and then have a 10-minute Q&A with each candidate so that we can ultimately determine who should uh, receive the $10,000 Sphinx Tank Award. As we judge their presentations, here are the five questions that we told them they must answer as part of their presentations to us. One, what is your project, of course. Second, what have you accomplished so far with this project? Why are you the best qualified person to lead this project? Why does it matter and to whom does it matter? And if you win, how or why would these funds make a difference, i.e., is your project sustainable? Um, and then we will score based on how they answer those five questions and the quality of their presentation style as well as their responses during our Q&A period with them. There are four outstanding panelists, in addition to myself here, uh, who will uh, adjudicate their projects uh, and be prepared. We, like the finals jury of the Sphinx competition, may not always agree uh, as we assess our, uh, our candidates, so you may hear some conflicting questions from us. Um, but that is also, of course, a reflection of the wider uh, world. Um, and uh, our amazing panel is comprised of, and I'm just going to share their brief affiliations, but of course, many of you already know them and or you can certainly uh, Google them. Uh, and we have Carla Canales, uh, who's founder of the Canales Project and Sphinx Medal of Excellence recipient. <laughs> we have with us Jane Chu, who's the immediate past chair of the National Endowment for the Arts and current arts advisor for PBS. And I have to add that Jane has also agreed to join our network partners, and so we'll bring the experience as a past NEA chair 
um, obviously in terms of that, as well as her experience at many other organizations literally raising hundreds of millions of dollars. And so our candidates will be able to benefit from her expertise, her guidance, and her feedback. In addition, we have Brian Offutt, who's the former chief operating officer of Sean Combs Enterprises, yes, P. Diddy, uh, <laughs> and current managing director of MediaLink. <laughs> And we have Stuart Thornhill, who is executive director of the Samuel Zell and Robert H. Lurie Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. And do keep in mind, we hope that this might be an annual event and project at Sphinx, and so anyone will be able to apply to participate to be a candidate in future years. So keep an eye out for the Sphinx notices uh, and keep an eye on the website. So with that, let's get started with the inaugural Sphinx Tank. Uh, please welcome our first candidate, Cameron Williams, founder of CaminiStrings.org. Good evening, everyone. My name's Cameron. I'm an 18-year-old first-year viola student at Juilliard, CEO and founder of Caminé Strings, and one of three co-authors of the book Kinderloop, the idea that I will be pitching to you all today. So as someone who has gone through the public school system uh, with siblings that currently go through that system, and someone who works often with students aged 5 to 11, uh, I've noticed that String, in, string instructors in elementary schools often just give their students instruments and expect them not to damage them, and of course, we all know that's never the case. So I thought of a solution to this problem. Originally, I thought, well, maybe I could go and give some sort of interactional uh, lesson to students, but then I started school in New York as a performance major, and this just didn't allow much time, so. I came up with another idea, Kinderloot. Kinderloot is a children's book that follows the story of four string instruments who are uh, very uh, apprehensive about going to their new owners because their previous owners didn't take very good care of them. So, and by the end of the book, they're very happy because their new owners now know how to take care of them and they can now focus on making music together. So I believe Kinderloot would be a great book to implement into uh, public school systems. One, because it can be used as a tool for teachers to introduce the idea of taking care of these very delicate instruments in a way that uh, students this age would be able to comprehend. And two, I think it could also be used at home for parents who may not be well versed in um, string instruments to also learn with their kids how to take care of these instruments. And I think this would ultimately allow for more time to play and practice, which is what uh, kids want to do with their instruments. So the idea for the book came from my foundation, Cam and A Strings, which was started in 2014. So a little bit about myself and the foundation. I started violin when I was five and switched to viola when I was 12. And in the time that I've played viola, I've had some amazing opportunities, like uh, my solo debut at Carnegie Hall when I was 13, pictured on the screen. Um, and at all these different events, I've heard the same thing. I sound great, but I need a new instrument. So I started looking for one, and I found one that was incredible, and I loved it. And I told my mom, but she said we had to send it back because we didn't have the money to pay for it. And about a week later, I was called into the family room, to open a case on the couch, and it was that viola that I tried a week earlier with a sign in the case that said, you are now the proud owner of this viola. And this was all thanks to my grandmother. She saw how much I loved the instrument and decided to buy it for me. And this made me realize that there are probably so many talented musicians out there that uh, probably just lack the proper equipment to be able to move on to the next level. So from there was born Caminé Strings. Now the mission of Caminé Strings is to provide string instruments to students who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford their own. 
And I accomplished this by uh, repairing donated instruments and putting them back out into the community. Here are just some of the things I've dealt with since I've started the foundation. And this was also uh, the process of when I started to think of Kinderloop. And also repairing string instruments has gotten me interested in the process of becoming a luthier, which is someone who makes string instruments. So from the work I've done in the foundation, um, I have come up with the idea Kinderloop, who was co-authored by my sister Music, who is 10 and plays cello, and my brother EJ, who's six and plays the violin. And the book has been written and illustrated, and I think just with this grant from Sphinx Tank, I'd be able to further the process into getting the book out there into the hands of school districts, public schools, uh, students, their parents, and I think this would ultimately allow for more time for kids to play, and I think the book would be very comprehensible and it's very fun. My brother reads it all the time, and he, he's sick, so he just started reading a few years ago, so he just runs around the house reading it. Um, and so that is my idea, Kinderloop. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we'll get into uh, questions. Well, Cameron, congratulations on your project. It's uh, very impressive. And I, we got to see some of the materials that you worked on. And I, you did a good job putting together a budget. Do you see um, how the budget is going to work in year two, in year three, in year four, in year five? Will it be the same amount that you'll need to raise every year? Um, I imagine that the budget might increase. I'm hoping. Uh, I see the book being very popular. Uh, in its initial stages, we'll go through some trial uh, stages with different school programs and different individual students in the community to see how it works. And then hopefully from there, it'll grow. And then from that, the budget will also grow from, for more materials. You have, you have an extraordinary personal story. And that never should be discounted in terms of a creative entrepreneur strong personal story goes very, very far. Um, but I was wondering, to build off of just what Jane mentioned with the budget, can you share with us more specifics or details about how you would market this? So let's say you have the funds, you can have the actual books. Um, because in your budget, there was even, um, I think you noted, uh, website marketing and advertising TBD. And so can you expound on that and why you chose to put that or what your plans are for how you'll engage schools or the other places to engage in it? Because it seems phenomenal. So initially I put to be determined because it was very much in its beginning stages. The book had not been written yet. It was literally an idea and we were just coming up with the storyline. And so now that we have the book, um, I have uh, actually talked to a few of the schools and programs in my community and partnered with one of them to, uh, once we get the book printed, to have them test it out in their school and in the program, see how the kids respond to it and see um, how the damages are before we introduce the book and how it is after and compare that and see how it is. And then from there, we imagine that um, just initially from that program, they spread the word, but then on social media, uh, there's a link to the book uh, and the uh, proposal on my website for Cam and A Strings for the Foundation, and from there, people can look into it. And also, um, there's the page on Facebook, and then we also have an Instagram, so promoting it through there as well. So I I'm a little curious about the... Uh the creative team here. It's, it's you, your younger brother, your younger sister. Um, how did you resolve your creative differences on this one? <laughs> uh, well, we all have very different personalities. I'm much more laid back. My sister is a very, she's very sassy. My brother, he's very <laughs> aggressive. <laughs> so, um, but I'm the oldest, so most of what I say goes, but I, I allow them 
I, I allowed them to have their ideas, but uh, honestly, we get along. We get along very well, so it wasn't too big of a catastrophe at home going well, I, through the. I mean, writing I, process. I ask this with some seriousness because if if you are successful, um, have you even talked about? Well, this is the first project that we can do together. We've we've established that we can create something. We've got a product. Can you turn it into? Another book? Is it a different instrument? Is it you know extending the story? You know, is this part one of a, a of a trilogy? Can you can you see this growing and, and building beyond more than, than just the book? Yes, that is the plan to start off with the string instruments for Kinderlute, and then hopefully for later books we can do like Kinder brass, Kinder percussion, Kinder woodwinds, and my uh, like I mentioned before, my brother and my sister and I were all string instru instrumentalists. Uh, but my mom, she's, uh, she plays everything. She's winds and brass, so she can um, also teach us about that, and we have some resources within our community to also gain that sort of information for the other books. Congratulations. Very well. cool. So Cameron, um, I was just as interested in the foundation you started when you were 14 years old as I am in the book. Um, I was wondering, you know, when you sought to seek partnership and funding and build something big to change the world, why did you decide to go the book route instead of building your foundation, right, and, and sort of delivering instruments to more kids? Do you think the book gives you the ability to make more change in the world? I mean, I'd just be curious to know why that's the priority. I think when, when we first started the idea for the book, I was in my senior year of high school, so I was going through applications and auditions, and so my original idea was to make it, um, like put more of a face to uh, my project, but then as I realized I was traveling a lot, there was just no time for, no real like effort time to put into that sort of, um, dedication to the project, so that's why I started with the book, and then from here, I hope that it grows and then I can do more of that, or even my siblings can do more of that. Do you think the book leads more kids to music than, let's say, giving instruments uh, in school systems? Um, I wouldn't say necessarily gives more, but maybe an addition to it. Okay, thank you. I want to jump in with a personal question, if you don't mind. I'm really in awe, as I think everyone has said, of your personal story and particularly the impetus that you had at 14 years of age to start a foundation and to already be so civically minded and engaged. I'm curious how you balance this, this project and the foundation and this desire to push the book forward, particularly if you could speak to your plans for marketing and branching it out so that the book can get as much exposure as possible while you are a freshman at Juilliard, did you say? Yes. So that, those are two kind of almost full-time things. Yes. How do you plan to balance that? And uh, if you might be able to speak to the sustainability of where you might see that in three to five years. Yes. Uh, so, yes, I am a full-time student at Juilliard, but um, Everything that I do, none of it would be possible without my family. I think that's a very important uh, fact for me to state. None of this is done solely by myself. Um, and so my, the board for Cam and A Strings is all made up of my family members. And that all includes paralegals, publishers, um, attorneys, musicians, my mom and dad. They're, um, I get a lot of help from them. So. I, I'm definitely not in this alone. Um, as far as uh, sustainability, um, whenever I have an idea or I want to expand on something that I've already done, um, I can just call up my family members since they are a part of the board, and I say, hey, I have this idea. Um, what do you think I should do about this? You know, I'm, you know, I'm in school. I have performances all the time. Um, but I really want to get the ball rolling on this. So we need to sort of lay out some sort of plan. And so that's uh, the idea that I do whenever I have a new project. We sort of lay out a plan, lay out a timeline, and say, okay, we need to get this done by here, get this done by here, and that's uh, usually how it goes. Tell us a little bit about the process uh, 
of, of what you put, the process of creating the book, did you just put in the book, what's the content like? Did you put in the book um, what you do every, when you play? And what did you discover from your brother and your sister when they read the book that helped you make the book even better? Um, well, I can actually <laughs> so, uh, the focus of the book wasn't necessarily me and what I do. I wanted to really focus on what you shouldn't be doing with the instrument. So there's stuff like, don't pluck the strings too hard, don't turn the pegs when your teacher hasn't taught you how to turn the pegs, wipe down your instrument. It's just very basic things that you should uh, be doing uh, when you first get your instrument. Because obviously when these children get the instruments, they don't understand the value of it and how uh, delicate they are. So I really just wanted it to be very basics about that. Um, and working with my brother and sister, they're both young and they started very young. Um, so a lot of this also came from their experiences. As having musicians all around them didn't do anything with them learning how to take care of an instrument. They went through all this same stuff too. So they, uh, the process of writing it, they were like, oh, I remember you telling me to do this so many years ago. Um, and my brother just started, so he'd say like, oh, I remember you telling me this a few months ago. So that, that's how the process of the book kind of went along. And Cameron, one last question. How are you gonna get this into lots of public schools around the country, right? Dealing with boards of education and regents and curricular committees and textbook companies, what are you gonna to do to make everyone in the country see this book? Well, I am hoping to publish it on Amazon and have eBooks available everywhere. So uh, initially I wanna start small and get it in my uh, home school district, Palm Beach County School District, and hopefully get it out through there because I have a lot of um, connections through public schools in that system. And then from there, um, Hopefully it will grow to state, uh, surrounding states, and then country from there. Great. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you. <laughs>
what you would see is about half to three quarters of the audience members are people from underserved communities who have not had to purchase a ticket to get into the concert um, and were probably brought there because of the contact they had with our young artists in their own communities. As I look at what we've accomplished in the past four years, I think back to how it all began and why this came about in my head and why, what was, what was the wish to do this? Where did they come from? And I think back to the fact that at eight years of age, I came to the US with my mother. Uh, and so I'm an immigrant. And as many of the immigrant stories go, I spoke no English, not a word, but I picked up the cello in my first week of elementary school. I had no idea what a cello, violin, anything was. But I think that contact with an instrument helped me to express something that I couldn't express in words at the time. And so I was learning from, by ear for the first uh, few months to a year. And then I think that because of our background in many of our countries in South America, with the exception of Venezuela, which now has a really strong tradition of classical music performance, um, we don't understand the value of a teacher. So my mother probably didn't understand the value of uh, what a teacher would do for me. So I didn't have a personal, a private teacher for the cello until I was in my first year in university. Everything I did, I did by ear. And I watched all of the great cellists. And I listened over and over again to the same CDs, Yo-Yo Ma, Janusz Starker, all these people. And as I got closer to university age, I had the opportunity to study with some very, very um, important influences in my life, like Janusz Starker and uh, Gary Hoffman. And I realized in that moment, when I go back through this, my own personal story, that were I not here, if I were in Ecuador, there was no way possible that I would have had those influences in my life. And so I think that's the reason that we've created this platform for really gifted young artists in South America to have similar opportunities, as I've had, as some of my colleagues in this room have had. Um, in the near future, in the immediate future, funding this festival helps to continue the scholarship model that we have. It helps to keep our two-week model. In the past, we funded the, uh, the festival by private sponsorship grants, which I write a lot of, and in-kind donations. It's a very small operation. It, doesn't have a huge budget, as you will see. But it gets the job done. And, and we really have an, a great intensive program for two weeks where we calculated the amount of activities that each artist, uh, uh, the amount of lessons, let's say, that they receive is almost equivalent to what they would receive in a semester of college. Because it's very intense. Morning to night, every day for two weeks. And so I would like for you to take a look at this video that I prepared and you'll get a glimpse of what we do and meet some of the artists at Festival Esmeraldas. Thank you. Uno tiene un deber como artista y joven artista en estos tiempos también, ¿no? El de tratar de formar parte de algún cambio y compartir lo que uno sabe con otras personas. El Festival Esmeraldas se inicia con la idea de brindarle a jóvenes artistas latinoamericanos las mismas oportunidades que tuve yo que es traernos maestros de categoría mundial que no podemos tener a la mano. No hay nada que envidiarle a cualquier festival de Estados Unidos o de Europa. De hecho, son las mismas personas que visitan estos festivales. Trabajar individualmente con ellos, tocar música juntos, porque esto puede marcar la diferencia en el futuro de ellos. And so, which is why he decided to come back to his home city and start bring some music back to Esmeraldas. Y poder hacer algo por esa generación de talentos que venía después de nosotros. Festivales como estos motivan a las personas incluso a apoyar más el arte. We're not that different from other animals. The biggest, one of the biggest differences besides the fact that we have great language. 
And one of the most special languages is music. Siempre he sentido que la música es un, como un lenguaje que nos une todos. It's what makes us feel like human. Hay que mucha gente que no sabe de la música clásica, por eso no ama la música clásica. Depende de nosotros de poder eh, romper esa barrera que existe. Por medio del arte, por medio de la música, se puede unir a la gente. Yo creo que el arte te ayuda a eso, a crear un sentido de comunidad. Thank you so much, Francisco. And we will go to questions, if anyone would like to kick us off. Can I jump in here, Aaron? Primero, felicidades. Congratulations. It's uh, tremendous what you've already accomplished. Um, I have one kind of core question. You mentioned that the festival is two weeks long. Yes. So what's going on for the rest of the year? What is, is there a sustainability model for the participants that come for the two weeks? How are they? enriching what they get in that two weeks in order to build on that for the next year? That's the question that I bring up to myself every single edition. And the plan from now moving forward is that we would like to develop um, relationships with U.S. institutions, U.S. colleges and conservatories, that to make it clear that we want to be a recruitment pool so that if some programs could be built up with those institutions that we can uh, let the students fly over for lessons with the teachers or create some kind of program that will give the festival some continuity beyond its two week period. That's something that we're currently working on, but it's, again, it's a very young project, so it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, but it is something that is in the consciousness that we're, if I may, just to continue on this, are there any local teachers that are based there that are part of the program no. or is all, all of the instruction is coming from abroad? All of the instruction is coming from abroad, but so are, so are the young artists because um, it, there, as I said, from 11 different countries, mm -hmm. predominantly in uh, South America. But what the importance of this platform is, is that we have plenty as my South American uh, compatriots will know. We have plenty of programs that focus on orchestral training, mm -hmm. a lot of orchestras, a lot of youth orchestras. What I don't see enough of is focus on chamber music and individual development of te technical uh, mm -hmm. elements in playing. And I think that's really where we should start before we put people in orchestras. So that's been the goal, one of the goals in creating this festival. First of all, in the heart of South America and Ecuador, open it up to kids from all over South America. Well, they're not really kids, they're 17 through 30 years old. So early university age or young professionals already, where we're giving them something when they most need it in order that you know, many of them want to come to the US to study, but there's no one to connect them. So I think this platform serves as that. It's in a way, it answers the first question of sustainability. I think it, um, this is a place where we want them to connect to people, who the faculty members, uh, a dean from a university that may come over to visit, and that they know which options are open to them beyond that two week period, as you say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just uh, picking up on, on Carla's question about going forward, I. I'm interested in that four-year journey to get where you are here now, because uh, I'll assume that you didn't get everything right the first time, um, and that there's been some stub toes and some learning as you've gone through. So how have the lessons that you've learned in those first couple of iterations shaped your vision for where you want it to be four years or, or 10 years from now? Well, to put uh, just a little bit of data forward, we started with a budget that was fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for the first festival, and that covered activities for ten days for forty-five people in Esmeraldas, which is uh, it's cheaper to do things there. It was very contained, small group of uh, faculty members, unknown, including myself, <laughs> and I knew that we had to keep going because people came, young artists came, forty-five of them came to study with people they didn't know. Um, 
And so then it was evident that there is a real need. And that's the reason, so that was the reason to keep going. Um, from then forward, I think knowing that there is a, an evident need, we, I, I play concerts tirelessly to fund this thing myself, you know. Um, I apply to grants, I, all of the things that I've already explained. In four years from now, I think, not in terms of getting bigger, but of working on these issues you brought up, for example, of developing connections for the festival with institutions here, predominantly here because it's closer to South America, so it's just a practical matter. And uh, seeing how we can help young artists go into the professional life. So you reference a budget, the um, at least in the materials I think that you submitted, you know, before this session, I didn't see a budget. I, I, uh, I did submit a budget. Gotcha. Uh, so could you just clarify then what the budget ballpark you're anticipating for this next year, in total? given that, that start of 15, what is that budget? Well, last year was our biggest addition because we had, for the first time, a full symphony orchestra, uh, which included housing, wind, wind players, and percussion, and so on, um, and a conductor. <laughs> so uh, this year, we, uh, we're not putting on a full symph symphonic program. It ought to be just, str just strings. So I think the budget will go down. Last year was 60,000. Gotcha. I think this year we can bring it down to 45. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and with that, so and, an amazing program, incredible impact, and the caliber of artists that you're engaging is right, like, extraordinary. Um, is there, um, and you also shared how you're, you know, working, you know, your butt off with recitals and raising funds, but as you look at this as a sustainable enterprise, right, that I would think can only go on. So you can only, you know, just give recital after recital, raising probably small amounts of money and being very frustrated yeah. with that. So as you look strategically, who do you see as the prospective funders that could really come together to make this sustainable over the long term? And when I ask that, I mean, um, do you see more individuals or do you see more institutions? And do you see it being more US-based funding sources mm -hmm. or funding sources from Ecuador or from, or from somewhere else, um, and how and why those people that you think will become those funders, what is it that is their hook into the program? Why are they committed to it as you are? So there are a lot of subcategories to that question, so let me, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> let me get yeah. through. Um, at the moment, I th to, to, to start with individuals, the base of our followers and the people who believe in the work that we're doing, even at a, from a distance, is growing. Because I show videos like this, or bring one of the young artists and have them give their story of what their experience was like, and that's enough to, to hook people. Um, because what you see is what you get, you know. That's, that's it, there's nothing more. So um, I think with that message, we're growing our base of followers individually. I apply to all the grants possible, and as you say, play, play all the recitals. So if we know that works, keep it, right? Um, I will come back to the institutional connections because I think those are very important. I think in the US, there's always been, and more so now, I feel the need to diversify the student bodies. So we're looking for Latino players, African American players. Why not include also South American, you know, players who may not live here, but um, offer them that opportunity to take part in these study programs here in the U.S. So, what I would propose to an institution from the U.S. is use our platform as a recruitment pool, but send us some teachers. You guys cover that if we're going to do this, mm -hmm. and that's it. That's uh, one of the steps uh, moving forward, which I think will help us tremendously. Kind of a partnership model exactly. in that way. And is there, are you getting support locally in Ecuador? Because it seems like a huge swath of, of impact is on residents of mm -hmm. Ecuador. And so mm -hmm. is there a commitment or an understanding in that community of the benefit for that community? Uh, in Ecuador, uh, well, 
It's a good question. In Ecuador and most South American countries, we don't have the model of charitable giving. It just doesn't, people don't think that way. So if they give something, it's in kind. So we can have uh, a discounted rate on hotels, which we get. We have discounted rates on buses. So we get this, a lot of discounts and meals prepared for the whole group, stuff like that. But in terms of um, real funding, we, we, no, we don't. And I don't want to count on that either because it's not always reliable, to be frank. Yeah. Francisco, what, yeah. uh, tell us a little bit more to build on that uh, Aaron's question. Tell us a little bit more about your audience. You say that they're really drawn to hear these performances. What is drawing them and what are they like? Are they community members? Are they parents, business owners? Uh, tell us about them. The, the uh, audience members. Yeah. The audience members. Uh, the audience members are predominantly from very uh, poor communities. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is very simple. If you just think back to the first time that you heard something that really moved you, that's their reaction that they're having when they're full adults. And so that's enough to draw them into concerts. All right, and we are unfortunately out of thank time, you. but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up into the Sphinx Tank, please join me in welcoming Quanice Floyd, founder of Arts Administrators of Color and the Sankofa Project. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands of the Peoria, the Ashinanobek, the Potomac, and the Miami Nations. And we respect our elders, past and present, so please take a moment to consider all of the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us all here today. Baba yo, Baba yo le, Baba Orisha, Baba yo, Baba yo, Baba yo le, Baba Orisha, Baba yo, I can't hear you. Baba yo, Baba yo le, Baba Orisha, Baba yo, Baba yo. Baba yo le, Baba Orisha, Baba yo. <laughs> so good evening, panelists. Good evening, hosts. Good evening, audience members. My name is Kwanis Floyd, and I am the founder and director of the Arts Administrators of Color Network. Um, and I'm so blessed to have to come here and participate in Sphinx Tank and to bring my project, the Sankofa Project, to you all. So a little bit about the Sankofa Project. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was going to a conference, and this conference was focused on arts and community. And so um, in the community that they chose to have the conference, I was very familiar with. I knew artists from that community. I had friends from that community. I had, uh, you know, I've been into that community plenty of times. And so when I got to that conference, I was so excited. I was like, yes, they're gonna bring all the artists that I know. They're gonna know, bring all the community members that I know. And I get there, and the speakers, the sessions, the audience and attendees do not reflect anybody in that conference, in that, uh, in that community. And so when I think about that, I think about the history that that community had. Because back in the 1920s and the 1930s, the community had people of color who wanted to build up the arts leadership. So they created an arts district. And so that arts district became a collective and a collaborative over time. And so the fact that that conference came to that community and didn't embrace that, that kind of, that was dis disheartening to me. And so um, when I think about that, I think about the elders and the ancestors who were able to build that up. And so Sankofa means to go back and get it. So we're embracing our past and uplifting to propel our future. So the Sankofa project is a two-year project and it will document the histories and legacies of arts leaders of color um, as well as highlight the work that they've done um, in written and recorded formats. 
And then we want to appreciate, celebrate, and honor those elders and ancestors. And so the main components of the project include a video series leading up to a documentary. So thus far, we've started an ongoing social media campaign. So for any of you in the audience who haven't seen my posts yet, please find me and I will come send them to you. So, because we need crowdsourced information of elder arts leaders that you all know to be a part of that. And through that, we've compiled a list of about 100 people, including Dr. Um, excuse me, <coughs> Dr. Walter F. Anderson, um, David Yarbrough, Richard Smallwood, and so much more. But we, we need more information. And so right now, we're compiling these lists, we're crowdsourcing, and um, we've been getting the pre preliminary production um, and the research around the production for that video series. And so the organization that is hosting this project is the Arts Administrators of Color Network. And so the Arts Administrators of Color Network is the only 501c3 standalone arts service organization for all folks of color in the arts of all disciplines. And so we're committed to empowering, oh thank you. We're committed to empowering arts leaders by providing opportunities, tools, resources to advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion, and access in the arts for all. So our organization was founded on those who came before us. Therefore, our ancestors are infused in the DNA of our organization. Uh, our organizations include a mentoring program where we merge emer uh, emerging leaders with uh, elder arts leaders. We have a podcast where we highlight arts leaders elder arts leaders who are still doing the work. We have an annual convening where it's a yearly event where we bring people from all over the nation to um, have intergenerational conversations. And we've also awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award to Carol Foster, who's an arts educator um, in the field. And so, why is this work important? The voices of those who came before us matter. We should never have to question their experiences and we should know their stories. Because as we continue to push for racial justice, social justice, equity in, the, in this field, uh, we have to constantly understand what happened in the past to evaluate where we want to go in the future. So that's Sankofa. And so what we plan to do with the grant is we plan to execute our documentary. We're going to interview all of the arts leaders who are in our list. We're going to travel to them, we're going to document it, we're going to um, create a data collection and create supplemental uh, materials to support what they're saying. We're also planning on creating a curriculum to give to arts administration programs around the nation so that because a lot of the stories of people of color in arts leadership have been left out. And so I want to thank you so much for this opportunity and thanks and I'm welcoming your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kwanis. And we'll go to questions. And I might even just uh, jump in initially. So two quick ones, and maybe if you're responsible, because I don't want to take up too much of the time from the rest of the panel. So uh, first one, um, uh, you mentioned uh, crowdsourcing mm -hmm. the people who you will be including in the historic arts leaders. Um, were you planning on incorporating other ways to identify who these leaders are? Um, certainly, you know, there are probably those in, you know, academic environments who will be like, you know, there's always a, you know, some people say, oh, crowdsourcing is, you know, could potentially produce different results mm -hmm. than, say, putting together a, a group of, you know, uh, historians in the biggest academic institutions who kind of spent their lives researching some of this stuff is right. do you have will you specifically only be doing crowdsourcing or broader and if so how what led you to those decisions yeah so we're gonna do it broader we plan on um, reaching out to potential partners um, there's organizations that focus on arts leaders of color throughout the nation as well um, we plan on using them as a resource. We also plan, we have connections with the arts, um, the Association of Arts Administration Educators. We plan on using them as a resource. And so um, we want to build up that, we want to use, we want to have our hands and our feet and everywhere we can to build up this comprehensive database about arts leaders of color. Gotcha, great. And just the, my second question goes to, um, with the budgeting, mm -hmm. that um, you have a fair amount of, 
funds going towards the celebration of the documentary right. and, and doing all of that, but I really didn't see, um, other than there were, I think, two and a half thousand for kind of marketing of the celebration, mm -hmm. but not of the actual documentary. So I'm wondering, what's your intention in terms of who will ultimately see the documentary, mm -hmm. and how are you planning on actually bringing that about so that more than just the people at the celebration actually see it, because it doesn't seem like you're investing in that. Right, so um, the documentary will start off pilot, piloting in DC, so the DC Commission of the Arts and Humanities actually underwrites um, the Lincoln Theater, so we plan on using the Lincoln Theater as a space for us to pilot that documentary, but we are also looking into options of taking it on tour. Um, so what, does that, what would that look like to, to have the document on tour going to different cities and reaching out to those communities to talk about arts leaders of color, the elder arts leaders of color. And do you have on your budget the, is it all contributed revenue? Is that the main source of revenue or do you have any kind of an earned revenue stream? So we have contributed revenue. Um, we have earned uh, revenue um, through, well, we have individual donors um, who give a lot to our organization as well as um, grants that are on their way into our organization. Do you have any, um, earned revenue like tic uh, ticketing or anything like that? Or yeah, so revenue? we would have a, a ticketing for the, the major event. Yeah. Because we don't want to place any barriers for anybody to, to not be able to access, you know, the documentary. So, Quanice, this is, um, you've crafted a beautiful creative idea in support of an incredibly important mission. But the people you need to involve in this, if you're going to succeed, are besieged by other important missions. And mm -hmm. earlier, when you were talking to the audience, you said, um, at one point you said, please find me, when you were talking about your initial efforts. And right. as I listened to you say that, I thought, that's not something I hear most entrepreneurs say. Most don't say, please find me. Most say, I'm gonna find you. Right. And so I'd like to know more about your background and more about who you are as a person to understand how you're gonna sell this thing. How are you gonna make it number one on everyone's radar? Great, um, my, where can I start? So um, my background is I've been a music teacher. I've taught general music uh, for pre-K three all the way to fifth grade for the past almost 10 years. Um, I created the Arts Administrators of Color Network in 2016 um, after getting my second master's in arts management and noticing that there were not too many people of color in the same rooms as, uh, room as I. Um, and so, after having conversations with a close friend of mine who's now a board member, uh, we created the Arts Administrators of Color Network, and through that, we've been connecting with co arts leaders of color all around um, the United States. And so, with that, you know, I, uh, my background is more so music education, arts leadership. Um, I've, I go to events all the time. I come to the conferences all the time. I present all the time. Um, I've created uh, arts and culture affinity spaces for people of color, so I've connected with a lot of people through that, and so, um, yeah, I just, I feel like I'm one of the best people to do that because I have such experience with race, equity, um, creating affinity spaces, safe spaces for people of color in the arts. Okay. I, I think I've got a, a similar area of interest to, to Brian's question, but maybe coming from a different angle. It's clear how much uh, the history and the story of the culture and the ancestry matters to you, and, and as a teacher, I'm. I share with you the importance of knowing what's come before so we can understand where we are and where it goes forward. But as I teach, so many of my students are only interested in the today. Um, can, you, can you tell us how are you gonna engage them in that, in that passion, that need to know where they came from to, to, to help them grab a hold of this with you? Right, so I was focusing more so on like the graduate and undergraduate arts administration programs. Yeah. Um, and so when I contacted um, the Association of Arts Administration Educators, they were like flat out just ready to do it. Um, and so through those programs, I have access to over 100 arts management programs throughout the nation. Um, and then one of the things that they're working on is how to decolonize their syllabi. And so that can kind of help with support that work as well. That makes sense. I'd like to jump in for a moment. Um, I just sort of want to go back a little bit and would like to ask you about the actual content mm -hmm. um, because this, the scope of what you're describing is incredibly ambitious and important. But I wonder, particularly in terms of the documentary, are you, I'm not clear, are you looking to 
identify the leaders and pay tribute to them? Are you looking to gain information on best practices in their experience? Is it more of an academic resource? Is it more of a celebratory resource? I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit more. It's actually all of the above, okay. which is very ambitious, yes. Um, so I hope to um, learn about their journeys, learn about the history, learn about the things that they do. It's kind of like a genealogy exam. I mean, not exam, but a genealogy track, tra tracking. Um, and so going backwards, learning who you are, learning how they are, learning their experiences in art le arts leadership, learning about the barriers that they've come into in arts leadership, um, and highlighting that so that emerging leaders of color can relate to that and know that they're not alone in this, uh, in this, this conversations that we have on an everyday basis in these situations. And so um, helping to propel that story so that people understand, you know, this is what's been happening, these are the stories that's been happening, um, a lot of people have been left out in these, con in these conversations, and so a lot of people have created their own spaces. Um, and so, yeah, just thinking about like how to uplift that, celebrate that, embrace that, honor that, all the above. Thank you. And But just to be clear then, it is much more about the personal story rather than the content of the work trajectory. Is that correct? Uh, can you clarify that? In other words, you're, you're looking really to celebrate the personal stories of arts leaders administrators, of leaders of color, yes. um, and, and the obstacles that they overcame, mm -hmm. rather than the actual work that they may have done in the position and their best practices as such. Well, it's a mix of both. Um, so I'm, I'm not clear on where the, the mix comes in. Right. So when, you, when we interview them, we plan on talking about their journey, how they got to that position, okay. but also talking about um, the work that they've done while they were in that position. So were they you know, a trailblazer in you know, creating the first black dance company, for example? Okay. Um, and so we want to embrace both of those parts of the story because you have to know, you know, it's Sankofa. You know what your past is and you know where your future is. So their past is that journey and then the future is what they've done in that work. Thank you. Thank you. So and maybe just to pull off of what was kind of asked a little bit, if this is successful five years from now, what will be different mm -hmm. in the field? What will be different in the world if this is, meets the highest level of, of what you would like it to be? Right, my hope is for arts administration, arts and um, arts management programs to incorporate people of color in general um, into their curriculum. So I'm hoping that we can push that, creating supplementary uh, resources and materials, maybe creating a syllabi down the line, um, but just pushing that more and so into the arts and management, arts administration, arts leadership uh, field. And because if these materials and this curriculum is there, it will empower those programs to recruit more diverse candidates? Yes. Gotcha. Did you have well a specific? Did oh, you, oh yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> okay. but one more. I think we can squeeze in one more before they yell at us. You can probably just say yes or no. Did, uh, did you have a specific way of calculating all the line items in your budget? Have yeah, you so I reached out to different vendors that we know, specifically in the Arts Administrators of Color Network. We have a lot of people who are artists themselves, and I've reached out to those who I felt had the best rates overall for our project. Thank you. Great. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, everyone hanging in there? All right, our final candidate, uh, and actually this is the one candidate where it is a team of two. Uh, and so please join me in welcoming Elena Uriosti and Melissa White, founders of Intermission. The teachers, the technique, uh, the sequence is just 
phenomenal. Being in the company of, of musicians, fantastic musicians, who are in tune with themselves and their body, you know, from a musical standpoint, has been really just empowering. I think the biggest the the biggest takeaway is the fact that you're in a community of musicians, you know, doing all kinds of things in the in the field, and just that alone, and they're coming to join their mind, body, and spirit in yoga. It's, there are no words to describe it. It's an experience. Hi, we are Melissa White and Elena Uriosti of Intermission, a groundbreaking program that unites music, movement, and mindfulness through a series of retreats for professional musicians and workshops for students. You just saw a glimpse of our very first Intermission retreat in 2017. Despite the warm, sunny atmosphere that you saw there, being a professional musician presents a unique set of physical, emotional, and mental challenges. As artists, we spend our lives giving, but how many of us creative types truly take the time to care for our own minds, bodies, and spirits? After we each won the Sphinx competition at age 16, we got a taste of life as touring violinists. And since then, our performance and traveling demands have only increased. We're both lucky to have discovered yoga nearly a decade ago and to have been able to maintain regular yoga practices alongside our careers. Having been injury free for all 10 of those years, we are now able to see the disparity between our own routines and those of so many other musicians. Through intermission, we have cultivated an incredible community of both professional and student musicians who are now also passionate about caring for themselves. However, there are factors that limit musicians' in-person access to intermission, like geography, scheduling, and finances. But we believe that wellness should be available to all. We want to expand the reach of intermission and make our music, movement, and mindfulness tools available digitally through the creation of an app. Now, I get to play bad cop. The number of our colleagues, young students, and even big name performers who are suffering from injury these days is staggering. Over 60% of conservatory students and nearly 75% of professional musicians have reported injuries that affect their playing. Sadly, those statistics included us back in our teenage years. Making music is physically demanding. Have you ever seen us when we walk off stage? We're a mess. In our own way, we're actually athletes because it's not just our fingers or our voices that are working hard, it's our entire body. But for some reason, musical training has neglected to address the whole body and even more importantly, the whole person. There's almost shame about speaking up when we feel pain, and in some cases, we're even encouraged to literally play through it. And then there's mental health, which is every bit as serious and often linked to physical well-being. In 2016, the largest known study into the working conditions of musicians showed that the music community may be up to three times more likely to experience depression compared to the general public. This actually wasn't all that surprising to learn. It's hard to even mention this, but four of our classmates at the Curtis Institute have committed suicide since we graduated. We're not pointing fingers, but schools can definitely be doing more to emphasize the wellness of the entire musician, because let's face it, it's all connected, and we creative types tend to feel our feelings pretty deeply. So how does yoga specifically factor in? In the summer of 2006, Harvard Medical School enrolled musicians from Tanglewood in a, in a yoga and meditation program. These musicians showed improvement in their muscles, performance anxiety, and general mood. The results from the study clearly suggested that yoga and meditation routines may help to reduce performance anxiety in musicians. Until a holistic, mindful approach to musical training is the norm and not the exception, there needs to be a resource that's not only available, but mainstream. And on that note, onto the good stuff. The Intermission app will be a one-stop shop for music, movement, and mindfulness content. Our users will have access to videos that provide musician-friendly stretches for each body part, fundamental posture and alignment tips, breathing exercise to help with performance anxiety, warm-up videos by professionals of every instrument, yoga sequences to help and restore the whole body, tips for mindful music making, and the app will also facilitate our retreat applications and house a merchandise shop. The in total cost of our project is $50,000, and we've already procured 30,000 of that. So we are well on our way to sharing intermission with everyone. Our app will be a low cost, life-changing, fun tool for musicians of all ages, levels, and means, looking to build the healthy habits necessary to sustain a life in music. 
and of course, other generic wellness apps exist. And then there are apps for musicians, like metronomes and tuners and glossaries. But there's no easy access portable resource that provides practical ways to deal with the physical, mental, and emotional demands of a musical career. The two of us live our lives at the intersection of music and wellness, and we have seen firsthand just how great a demand there is for a union of the two. We've helped kick off, for lack of a better word, a movement, and now we'd like to share that movement with all of you. So imagine you're on stage, about to walk out to perform in a performance, competition, or panel. Your heart is racing, <laughs> your hands are shaking, really, <laughs> and all you want to do is find your center. So let's work through this. Ground your feet, feel the soles connecting with the floor, put a gentle bend in your knees, and really feel rooted into the earth from the waist down. Bring your center of energy to your core so that the rest of your upper body can feel free and flexible. Rod in your collarbones, allow your shoulder blades to travel down your back. Maybe you relax your face into a small spine. And <laughs> and grow taller through the crown of your head. Now let's just take a few deep breaths here. Inhale, expansive breath. Exhale, your tension out. Now let's add the instrument. Inhale, your violin up to your shoulder. Exhale, any remaining tension out. One more inhale, and on your exhale, connect bow to string. Inhale to up bow. And exhale to down bow. Good. Take one more inhale, and on your exhale, begin to play your piece. Continue to breathe, allowing the, the sound to spin. Exhale. Inhale. And exhale. Inhale. Keep inhaling, exhale. Now imagine you had access to us in your dressing room backstage <laughs> before you walk out. <laughs> before you walk out to play in, say, the Sphinx competition. <laughs> that is the heart and soul of the Intermission app. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are you a collector of all these wonderful techniques that you're learning from uh, players of every instrument, or are you creating your own technique? We're creating our own technique okay. for violin, but okay. when we say professionals of every instrument, we've reached out to our colleagues who we know incorporate the mindfulness aspect and the movement and wellness, and we've asked them to share their videos. So that will be the content for instruments that aren't ours. So and it's kind of both and. You yes, both and several of them have been to our retreats or uh, work together in a more yogic context. I was, um, so I was, I was impressed, very prepared uh, for, for the presentation. Um, and so I had a question actually related to budget and kind of the organization of it. Um, first, I definitely like how you uh, mentioned how far you are towards your goal and that the majority of that is in kind through the app developer, yeah. right, which is absolutely great, and that's especially in the early days. Sphinx, the majority of Sphinx's budget was in kind, you know, and so it's a great way to be able to deliver those results. What I'm confused on with that, that app developer, it is kind of an investor almost because they will get some potential return, potentially five percent from any proceeds. So I'm trying to understand, is the project for-profit or non-profit, mm -hmm. and how, how are you defining it, and how are you looking at with the balance of the funds that you have to raise as investment money or as donations? I would say, at the beginning of the project, this is more, um, it will obviously be for for-profit eventually. Um, at the moment, where our passion is, is very much just to make these tools available to as many people as we can. Um, in terms of uh, the exact ratio of in-kind to investors, um, I think we're sort of more seeing how it goes, playing it by ear. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously the long-term goal is to make some money from this, but 
at the moment, we're, we're more concerned with just having people be safer in their musical practices. Okay. Just to add on briefly, so to, to start, it will be a free available app to all, but we plan on having um, a, a layer that will be a premium, and so then people will pay to have more access to further content, for longer videos, um, and that's how it will start to, to make its way. Got you. And I'm just wondering in terms of that classification for those who would be potential nonprofit foundations or something where they may have an inability to give to a for-profit versus individual donors who might have more flexibility or that, and just knowing who you could raise funds from versus who potentially you can't if you're a for-profit entity. And maybe just to, to follow up on a, on a separate additional thing, sorry, I'll be really quick with this one. The, um, with the uh, um, app, again, the, the, some of those costs I was looking at, but once you have it developed, suppose this is all successful and you have it, I didn't really see funds to then be able to distribute it or get it out there. So do you have a, a plan to how you will get it out there so that potentially millions of people will download it, because that usually, launching an app, you know, a lot of app companies have millions of dollars they spend on marketing, which obviously you don't have. So what's your plan? Yes, um, actually, so we plan on using the platforms we already have, social media. Um, we've started working with classical influencers, if you will, on social media who are ready to help um, get the word out. And we also have already started cultivating an audience that lets us know they would like access to intermission. And they would like, due to the what we said, the geography and not being able to come, they're ready to access in any way that they're, they're prepared to do. Um, and then we've, we've got some, some people who will help in the app world um, make sure it gets in front of eyes and, and in the hands of people who are the audience. We also plan to offer a um, access code to both our retreat participants and students that we work with in our workshops. So we'll be building um, a base through our pre-existing um, sort of intermission family as well. And then there's this audience. Yeah. And sorry, the... <laughs> there's this audience. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> so, if you, you know, with the injury statistics that you cited, your work is really important, right? You've got to get it right. Clearly in your retreats, you've seen that when you're together with people and you're teaching them your technique, you have an enormous impact on them. The testimonial from that artist was fantastic. Let me ask you something. How does the experience change or suffer if you're not together? See, I know we live in a digital world, right? But if someone is interacting with your app, they're not being trained by you. You can't watch them to make sure they're doing it correctly or that they don't inadvertently injure themselves. You can't let them benefit from the energy that so clearly exists when you're working with a student in person. So my question for you is, A, have you done any research about the effectiveness of this kind of you know, distant training versus in-person training? And B, if you knew that it was much better to do it in person, would you ever consider a different business model Right, where you use the app maybe to market yourself and you just do more retreats? Well, I think we're trying to achieve a combination of all of this. We mm -hmm. obviously would like to access as many people in person as possible, and um, we hope to expand the number of retreats that we host each year and the number of schools and festivals and organizations that will host us for workshops for students. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're, we're thinking of the app in two ways. One, as a a tool that will take the place of um, in-person visits. It, they're just not um, possible due to finances, geography, et cetera. And we also want to think of it as a stepping stone. Um, if people like what they see on the app, they might be more inclined to tell their institution to maybe bring us in for a session, or they might be inclined to save up money to invest in themselves to go to a retreat in person. Um, I think the, the uh, availability of wellness apps, whether it's meditation or breathing or yoga, I don't think they're hurting anything. And in fact, I think a lot of people are inspired when they um, you know, click on Headspace or find um, an appealing yoga teacher that's available on YouTube. They might be more inclined to then go take a class in person. And we're hoping the app has a similar effect, as well as being sort of a, a placeholder for people who can come in person. 
Right, so you're not worried that if an old musician like Aaron tries to <laughs> work through your app, that he would hurt himself. You know, we actually have, and so we will you. have very basic. The idea is actually to start to introduce people just to movement and to start to know that being aware of your body will give you lots of information yourself. So even when we're with you, we can't tell you how your body feels and what's necessarily right or wrong, but we can guide you to start to have proper alignment to feel what the technique is to be stacked properly so that when you're going through these poses, you're doing it mindfully and safely for your body. And there will be lots of words. If you like to read, you can read through how to do this step by step. Cool, thank you. I'll need a lot of steps. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I share with Brian the appreciation of how powerful that experience is when you deliver it and there's the people in the room and the energy and they're, they're learning to each, with each other. Um, another way, I don't know if you've thought of this or it's where you're going, but thinking about growth, uh, developing a train the trainer model. So you can not just be the only mm -hmm. ones in the room, but you can start becoming the teachers and passing your knowledge along. So this becomes a network more than just a, a two person show. Absolutely. In fact, some of our participants from previous retreats have been in touch about wanting to go on to teacher training with us at the same time. So and, and also incorporating um, the things they've already learned at our retreats into lessons with their own students, um, sharing this information with their colleagues. So gradually we hope to expand the intermission family in all kinds of ways, the app just being one of them. I have a few questions um, kind of all over the place, so bear with me here. First of all, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak to your training in this field. I, definitely got a wonderful sense of your accomplishment, accomplishments as musicians, but I haven't gotten a sense of what kind of certification you might have in this sphere. Sure, so we, um, we are both, our official 200 hour trainings are scheduled for this year. I want to preface the, the uh, questions about the app content um, just by saying we are not by any means taking through our viewers taking our viewers through fancy, complicated yoga poses. We're really breaking down fundamentals of just stretching, um, warm-ups that you can do before you pick up your instrument, nothing that requires training, just um, basic movements that we want more people to know about to warm up their bodies, mm -hmm. stretch out their arms, mm -hmm. just make sure everything, you know, the blood is moving, things like that. And then we just break down very simple principles um, about hand alignment for weight bearing, how uh, your posture should look, basic breathing exercises mm -hmm. like that. For more advanced content, we fully intend to bring in, um, for example, some of the teachers that we have hired to run our retreats. We haven't actually taught the yoga at our professional mm -hmm. um, retreats, so we, we hire in people for that. And we plan on having all sort of guest content um, for more advanced practitioners. But um, as far as just basic movements that we can do, we do feel fully qualified to teach that. So you have completed the 200 hour? No, um, forthcoming. Forthcoming. So who is determining the actual content that will go on the app? Is it both of you, or do you have a network of certified yoga teachers or certified professionals? Both. Could you yes. speak to that a little bit? Yes, so our network of certified yoga teachers are the two we bring to our retreat, mm -hmm. and they've been certified beyond 500 hours actually. Um, one is married to a singer, and so she's very um, skilled in working with musicians and at festivals has worked with musicians on ailments and s specific stretches and things that help to align our body because of what we do. Um, our other teacher actually is recovered from many accidents, most recently a, a ski accident, and so she's worked through herself recovering many parts of her body to come back and be fully capable to be used for what she does, which is full-time. They're both full-time yoga teachers. So just, I guess, a part two, and I know we're out of time here, but um, if you could briefly speak to the fact that it, it, to me, it's sounding like it's very yoga geared or stretching um, focused, and I'm wondering where the mental and emotional support components that you spoke of come in. Absolutely, so there will be a lot of movement videos. We're also going to offer daily mindfulness tips that you can um, opt in or out of. Um, just little things to think about in the practice room when you're on stage. We'll offer many breathing exercises. 
Um, we talk about, we're doing a series where we talk about intentions that you can set mm -hmm. in, a, in the practice room or for a performance. Mm -hmm. So it will span the more mental and emotional side of the equation as well as the physical. Thank you. Great, and unfortunately we are out of time. Thank you so much. So now we will head to deliberate um, as Garrett to come back up and also keep in mind for your audience choice um, that they will actually be tabulating the top two audience choice awards so that if there is the circumstance where our final panel decision is the same as the audience choice, the audience choice will be awarded to the second audience choice because we don't want to just double up on one candidate. We want to be able to uh, be able to provide those additional resources to two candidates. So, wanted to kind of share that that will be that specific process. Uh, and with that, we'll turn it back over to Garrett, and we'll see you in a few minutes. So instructions on how to vote are here on the screens. And I'd like to invite each of the candidates back on stage with me. Um, I've selected one question um, from Slido for each of you uh, to answer while uh, we, we get the audience feedback. So if you could all come join me back on stage. You know, while they're coming up, something I was thinking about in, in institutions and organizations across the country and around the world, you know, the final yes or the final no falls in the hands of a single, all-powerful white man. Well, no, no shade to any of the white men in the audience, but it looks like the, the future is gonna look a little different, doesn't it? Can we give them all one more hand, round of applause? Cameron, this question is for you. Have you thought about um, an interactive or, or online version of, of uh, the, the book? Yes, I have. Uh... I think once um, we get the book printed, uh, creating an ebook is a, definitely a part of that process, and we want it to be sort of an in, uh, interactional thing. Uh, haven't quite decided the specifics of that, but that is definitely a plan in the uh, process. Wonderful. Uh, Francisco, so a question that was coming up on Slido a few times for you actually uh, has to do with funding. Where, where do you see the, uh, your funding principally going? What, what do you see as your, your biggest expense or your, or your biggest expense is? Flying artists in to teach. But that's the whole purpose of the, of the festival, so I think it's money well spent because it's pr pr particularly what we want to do is it's better to spend on 10 people who are coming to serve 60, let's say, as opposed to those 60 people being left to their own devices and figuring out a way to make contact or not. Sure, thank you very much. Kwanis, um, one question that came in for you. How will Sankofa define or identify um, the, the leaders worthy of, worthy of being featured? Oh. <laughs> so we identify elders or ancestors of people who are trailblazers in arts leadership. So anybody who has a history of creating programs or anyone who's um, broken barriers, um, like the Jackie Robinsons of arts leadership. So those will be the people who we consider elders and ancestors of the field. And for Elena and Melissa, so breathing is an integral part of the art of yoga. Well, breathing is also an integral part of the art of playing a wind instrument or singing. How will your app and how will your work translate for, for non-string players? We're good. Um, well, we will have the input of a lot of um, non-string players, particularly in the music section of the app, where um, we've already gotten videos um, from two wind players. Uh, one Sphinx familiar member, Anthony McGill, he has graciously donated a video of himself warming up. Um, so we continue to just use the musicians um, in our network to inform our own teachings, our own learnings. Um, so that's one of the greatest things about the intermission family. We can bounce a lot of ideas, and as musicians from different parts of the orchestra um, or the chorus, we can learn a lot from each other. Well, so it's been really great for me personally to see each of your presentations. Good luck to each of you. It's been great for me to be here with you. I'd like to turn things over to the president and artistic director of Sphinx, Afa Dworkin.
Doesn't Alpha always look fabulous? <laughs> thank you, Garrett. Thank you to everyone for being here, and thank you to our amazing, brilliant participants and entrepreneurs. I have a few things to ask of you as well. I'm wondering if each of you can take a moment um, to kind of identify a single most significant challenge that you've encountered in your respective entrepreneurial ventures and endeavors, what would you say has been the most difficult thing to tackle? I will just pick on Francisco. Oh, <laughs> um, building a good team and uh, takes time, but a lot of resources also. Mm -hmm. And when you deal with a project that you know, you're using every dime you can find towards something very specific, that uh, building the team is sort of put to the side because you think you can take everything on yourself as the organizer. So that's a big challenge is to put things in an order so that I can you know, rely on a team that can be helpful and, and everything, sure. things will run more smoothly. Yeah. That's the biggest challenge for me. So yeah. finding that balance and equilibrium yes. of, of building the capital that is human capital versus right. really seeking funding. Right. So that's certainly common. Pam? Um, I think aside from just my entrepreneur belt and performance belt, sure. um, just, I, I mean, I'm 18, I have like no resource, I don't know anybody. <laughs> so just being able to like, I have this idea, but I don't know where to go. So just being able to find people and just speak to people and be like, hey, well, I have this idea. I don't quite know what to do with it. Do you know somebody? Do you have any advice? And yeah, just finding resources for that. Absolutely. So in this case, finding the equilibrium, I guess we're, that's our theme today. Finding, identifying the equilibrium and reaching a place where knowing how to balance one's performance life versus being an entrepreneur. I think you're doing a wonderful job <laughs> myself. Um, let's see, Panis, what are your thoughts? Okay. You know, we'll fix it. Thank you. Um, resources, of course, but also having to talk to people as to why it is important to highlight leaders of color. Um, and I know, um, especially when we talk about racial equity and social justice, that um, we're trying to build a future where everyone has opportunities, resources. Um, and so that when people question that, that is one of the challenges because you have to change their mindset. They're kind of naysayers out there, so you have to change that mindset of um, how they approach those situations. Gotcha, so in this case, what you found is actually having to make the case and change the way people are aware of right. something that's a central challenge, but you still have to make the case for it. Right, or even notice it at all. Sure, that awareness and implicit being oblivious. That's powerful. Both of you can respond separately. Layton and Melissa, I'd love to know, and I'd love to see if there's a resonance between what you find to be most challenging. I'll go first. Um, of course, resources are always a thing, but um, honestly, I would say getting musicians to truly invest in themselves, because it's not something we're used to doing. We're kind of, we're always on the go, either to practice or to do the next gig, or to be available for the next gig. We don't even know if it's going to come. So putting time in our schedule, taking money we've made from a gig, perhaps missing a gig, to give ourselves time to recharge and do something that's really wholesome for ourselves has been, it's been a unique thing to start to build. It's coming, word of mouth, but it's been a, u a unique thing to see, have to, to persuade musicians about. Great. Um, and I guess my personal challenge speaks more to the, the equilibrium side of things. Um, we're dealing with, you know, intermission deals with music and yoga to really simplify it, which are two very analog things. Mm -hmm. um, and figuring out how to translate that into digital modern things like an app, like even making a website, um, even making some sort of business model. It's, these aren't things we were trained in. So sort of teaching ourselves and seeking advice how to um, just fit these two, like I said, very analog things into a more digital model. Sure, so this is kind of, this is about the equilibrium that deals with innovation, bringing something that's potentially, you know, one could say age old, two age old traditions, but you have to try to use innovation to make it relevant. Yeah, makes sense, definitely. 
something that I wonder, and, and in this case, I'll take volunteers. I think up until relatively recently, the word or terminology of entrepreneurship seemed irrelevant, maybe far-fetched, and if anything, difficult to pronounce. <laughs> so at the same time, I think we've sort of swung over to the other side, where anything that essentially is starting something is called entrepreneurship. And I am wondering if, if any of you budding entrepreneurs um, have thoughts on that. And maybe see if you can maybe tell the audience the first instance or, or time when you feel you remember yourself identifying to yourself and saying, I am an entrepreneur. I think it's this panel. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. What about those of you who were invited to do things as entrepreneurs or perhaps participate in the panel or come here? Did it come as a surprise? Like, I'm not an entrepreneur. That's not a relevant term. What's funny that I tell people is being a musician, we kind of have been that since we started gigging when we were, I don't know how old right. you were when you started doing your gigs, like 9, 10, 11. And we have been our own um, our own representation. We have been selling our artistry, mm -hmm. and so, and then we've we've been the ones who have had to figure out how we'll eat, how we'll pay rent, how we'll make our schedule, how we'll do the books, all of those things. So in a way, it's a word that I don't know if I quite res. I I wouldn't call myself that. It seems kind of funny, but it's just I feel like it's been a part of our lives since we started doing things, and then we've been passionate about these things. So you keep doing your passion. Absolutely. I am being told that our esteemed panel has made their decisions and determinations. Thank you for your wonderful questions and really sincere insight. I think it's great for the audience. I'd now like to ask our panel to enter the stage and join us. Thank you so much, and, uh, and first and foremost, uh, can we just get another round of applause for all of our candidates? <laughs> truly, truly extraordinary. And, and you may or may not have noticed Appa's uh, remarks probably lasted longer than otherwise anticipated because we took longer than we anticipated we would need to take because it was a very, very difficult decision. Very difficult. Um, because they're just extraordinary. And I'm um, so excited, especially about our network partners, um, because I have absolutely no doubt everyone on the panel is uh, in complete agreement that all of you will continue to build these initiatives into successful programs. So um, really just very much kudos to you. And the entire panel looks forward to being supportive for all of you uh, in the work that you are doing. So our first uh, award will go to the, uh, and after you, if you will uh, be able to present it, our Audience Choice Award. And our Audience Choice Award for the Sphinx, inaugural Sphinx Tank is Cameron Williams. Cameron Williams. <laughs> Inaugural Sphinx Tank, and along with a grant of ten thousand dollars, is Elena Uriosti and Melissa White for intermission. Congratulations again to all of our candidates. Many, many thanks to our incredible panel for your wisdom, your experience, your generosity of time. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much to our fearless leader. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.